Good morning, good morning, good morning. Well, end of another week, Friday. Got plans for the weekend. Hope to see you Sunday. Uh, so let's start with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord. Thank you so much for this time. Get to look into your word and help us, Lord, to uh, uh, do it in a way that's honoring to you. We always want to give you the praise and thanks you deserve. In Jesus' precious name I pray. Amen. Sin offering of the priest. So we're going to a section now uh, where we get into the sin and trespass offerings. And these are the uh, last two of the five, I believe. I think there's only five total of the offerings. So we did the uh, uh, peace offering. Uh, I if I remember, see if I can remember off the top of my head. Peace offering, the meal offering. And I know there's a third one. <laughs> Can't think of it right now. I think there's five total. Anyways, the last two is the sin offering and Leviticus and the uh, and the trespass offering. And these two actually uh, do not have uh, a sweet savor offering part of it. And they really represent the future Christ and what he's going to do for us uh, in, a, in a way of uh, paying the penalty for our sins. But first, uh, just like a good example, the priest has to, has to uh, atone for his sin first before he can atone for the sin of the people. So that's why I called this the offering of the priest. So this is for himself. That's the first 12 verses of chapter 5 here, or chapter 4. And so it's, again, it's a, centered around a brazen offer. So we'll, we'll bring that one up. And let's get some verses in here. I'll start out the verse, though, with a, a verse out of the uh, New Testament first. James, the brother of Jesus, a half-brother, and uh, same mother, different father. <laughs> Obviously, uh, God God is uh, Jesus' father, where uh, Joseph would be James's father. But they both had the same mother, and that's an important aspect to realize, that uh, Jesus was the the uh 100% man and 100% God. Uh, it's a hyperstatic union. That's another story for another day, but uh, it's an important aspect, and there's no way that Jesus could die for our sins if he wasn't one of us. He wasn't a human. and uh, But he had to be sinless also. So it's the, there's only one hyperstatic union, union, and that was Jesus Christ. We will meet in person very soon, I think. Okay, anyways, so here we head into the sin and trespass offerings. Uh, these were considered non-sweet savor offerings, represented by the future ultimate sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. So I want to take and first look at how, as an example, the priest would atone for his own sin first as an example to the people. I like what Dr. McGee says about this, uh, about us as leaders. This is a great example of uh, anyone who is uh, leading people or father or mother, uh, somebody who is uh, being looked at uh, by the uh, younger generation. So the sin of the priest is considered first. For he stood in the place of leadership. If he was wrong, the people were wrong. His sin was their sin. Like priests, like people. He was to bring a young bullock, the most valuable animal of all, as his offering. You see that the position of the one who is who sinned determined the type of animal for the sin sacrifice. His sin was no different, but his responsibility was greater. And still the same today. So let's see what James has to say. Verse 417. Therefore to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. And also verse James 3, 1. My brethren, be not many masters, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. So, this is again, Dr. McGee's uh, quote. Do you want to be a preacher? It makes you more responsible. Do you want to sing so a solo? It makes you responsible. Do you want to be a deacon or an officer in the church or a teacher of a Sunday school class? Then you are more responsible than anyone else. Privilege carries with it responsibility, and God himself will hold you to that responsibility. 
but I think it's also a joy to teach. And uh, I do my best to try to re represent the Lord as best I can, uh, but I do love to teach. And so I think the Lord called me to it. So I will take the, uh, the blessing along with the, uh, the punishment if I'm doing something wrong. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to read through the first 12 back, uh, verses of uh, Leviticus 4, uh, 1 through 12. And uh, then we'll look at a few things about it. So kind of think about the fact that Jesus is, uh, this is representing what Jesus did on the cross. And I'll try to point out a couple of things to really uh, pay attention to. Verse 1. And the Lord spoke unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, If a soul shall sin through ignorance against any of the commandments of the Lord, concerning those things which ought not to be done, and shall do against any of them, if the priest that is anointing do sin according to the sin of the people, then let him bring for his sin, which he hath sinned, a young bullock without blemish unto the Lord for a sin offering. And he shall bring the bullock unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation before the Lord. He shall lay his hand upon the bullock's head, kill the bullock before the Lord. This, this part sounds very familiar. And the priest that is anointed shall take of the bullock's blood and bring it to the tabernacle of the congregation. Again, very similar. And the priest shall dip his finger in the blood and sprinkle the blood seven times before the Lord, before the veil of the sanctuary. Actually, I will uh, bring up a, one different picture for this. Where is my... Uh, as my walk through. So we're talking about this veil here. Oh, I need the best picture. We'll go with this one. Now you can see the whole veil. So the veil, the veil back here. So this is the altar of incense. So the priest would come in here and sprinkle the blood seven times towards this. Uh, veil. Four, seven. And the priest shall put some of the blood upon the horns of the altar of sweet incense. That's this here. So he put a little bit on each horn. Before the Lord, which is in the tabernacle of the congregation, and shall pour all the blood of the bullock at the bottom of the altar of the burnt offering, which is at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. That's, that's where we just were. So you put it out here. Which is at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. He shall take off from it all the fat of the bullock for the sin offering, and the fat that covereth the inwards, and all the fat that is upon the innards, inwards. And the two kidneys and the fat there is upon them, which is by the flanks, and the call above the liver with the kidneys it shall it shall he take away. <clears throat> As it was taken off from the bullock of the uh, sacrifice of peace offering, and the priest shall burn them upon the altar of the burnt offering. So he's comparing it to uh, very similar to doing the peace offering. Now something's going to change a little bit. And the skin of the bullock and all his flesh with his head and with his legs and his inwards and his dung, even the whole bullock shall he carry forth without the camp unto a clean place where the ashes are poured out, and burn him on wood with fire, where the ashes are poured out, shall he be burnt. So now he's got to go outside the camp, and that means completely outside this area. Now here we don't really have anybody, but basically someplace outside the camp. Now think about that for a minute uh, as we look through the rest of these passages. That was verse 12. And think about... Jesus, and you'll, you'll see why they did this. Again, this whole thing is symbolic of Jesus. <clears throat> so the sin offering through st uh, still Christ is clean, uh, it is Christ seen laden with the believer's sin. So when, he, when, he, when, when the priest laid his hand on the bullock, he was uh, placing his hand uh, to know that uh, he, was a, he was acknowledging he was sinful man, and he was passing that on to the sacrifice. <clears throat> So laden with the believer's sin, absolutely in the sinner's place and steed, and not as in the sweet savoring offerings. In his own perfection, it is, a, it is Christ's death as viewed, 
I'm going to look through some verses. There's, two of them are pretty long, so th this is the bulk of our lesson today. It's Isaiah 53, 1 through 12. This is a very famous prophecy. Of uh, It speaks most, uh, you'll see it towards the end, but this whole thing speaks about Jesus Christ and uh, who he was and uh, what he's going to fulfill uh, on the cross. <clears throat> Who hath believed our report, and to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, as a root out of dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness, and when we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows, and acquainted with grief. We hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was displeased, and we esteemed him not. Surely he had borne our grief and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised upon for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. And we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was bought as a lamb to the slaughter, as a sheep before her shears is dumb. So he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment, and who shall declare his generation? But he was cut off out of the land of the living. For the transgressions of the people was he stricken. <clears throat> he made his grave with the wicked, and with the rich he and the rich in death, because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. The wicked were the two thieves on either side of him. But he was made his, uh, but the grave he was put in was of a rich man. Mm -hmm. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. We talked about this one yesterday. He hath put him to grief. When thou shall make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see of the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied by his knowledge. Shall my righteousness servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he hath poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors. And he bare the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. That's a famous Isaiah 53. This is the one chapter that uh, that the devout Jew does not want to uh, recognize exists. <laughs> it's kind of a, a humorous thing because uh, if you were to look in the Jewish typical Bible, you won't find chapter 53. Uh, but it's funny when they found the Dead, Dead Sea Scrolls that uh, chapter 53 was intact fully from the Dead Sea Scrolls in Isaiah. That uh, kind of God kind of saying, uh, you're not going to get rid of it that fast. <laughs> The next one is Psalm 22, 1 through 31. A Psalm of David, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why art thou so far from helping me and from the words of my, of my roaring? Again, listen closely. These Remember, this is a thousand years before Jesus was even born, that, that, uh, that uh, David was, uh, was writing this. It was a prophecy. It was a uh, foretelling. Verse 2. O oh my God, I cry in the daytime, but thou hearest not, and in the night season I am not silent. I don't think Jesus had a really great upbringing. I think people knew that uh, that Joseph was not his biological father, and it, uh, it got around. And so he was actually, uh, I think, picked on a lot as a child. Just my, That's just a guess. But when you read some of these other passages about the Lord, it really kind of sticks out. Continuing here in verse 3. But thou art holy, O thou that inhabitest the praises of Israel. Our fathers trusted in thee, they trusted and they did deliver them. Mm -mm. They cried unto thee and were delivered. They trusted in thee and were not confounded. But I am a worm and no man, a reproach of men, and despised of the people. All they that see me laugh me to scorn. They shoot out lips, they shake their heads, saying, He trusted on the Lord that he would deliver him. Let him deliver him, seeing he delighted in him. But thou, but thou art he that took me out of the womb. Thou didst make me hope 
when I was upon my mother's breast. I was cast upon thee from the womb. Thou art my God from my mother's belly. Be not far from me, for trouble is near, for there is none to help. Many bulls have compassed me. Strong bulls of Bashan have beset me around. That's Satan's, uh, I believe. That's uh, talking about, uh, this is mentioned again in the New Testament. I think it's speaking to the bulls that were, uh, basically uh, Satan and Hades, uh, the demons were also laughing. And they were around the uh, cross at the time of his death. Speculation there on my, uh, my part. Verse 12. They gaped upon me with their mouths as a raving and a roaring lion. I poured out like water and all my bones were out of joint. My heart was like wax. It melted in the midst of my bowels. This actual term uh, was uh, analyzed by medical experts when it comes to the type of uh, uh, crucifixion that Jesus went through. And realize in David's time frame, crucifixion hadn't even been invented yet. But the, the, this particular statement actually speaks to the fact of what happens when you're uh, you're hung on a uh, cross. <clears throat> my strength is dried up like pot shed. My tongue cleaveth to my jaws. Thou hast brought me into the dust of death. The dogs have compressed me, and the assembly of the wicked have enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. Again, another reference to hanging on the cross, which hadn't even been invented yet. I may tell all my bones, they look and stare upon me. They part my garments among them and cast lots upon my vesture. But be not thou from me, O Lord. O my strength, haste in thee to help me. <clears throat> Deliver my soul from the sword, my dealing from the power of the dog. Save me from the lion's mouth, for thou hast heard me from the horns of the unicorns. Interesting that unicorns is mentioned. Most people thought that that was a, a fictitious animal. Uh, there it is in the, in the Bible. <clears throat> I will declare thy name unto my brethren in the midst of the congregation while I praise thee. Yet they fear the Lord, praise him, O ye the seed of Jacob. Glorify him and fear him, O ye the seed of Israel. For he hath not despised nor abhorred the affliction of the afflicted, neither hath he hid his face from him, but when he cried unto him, he heard. My praise shall be... <coughs> <coughs> My praise shall be of thee in the great congregation. I will pay my vows before them that fear him. <clears throat> the meek shall eat and be satisfied. They shall praise the Lord. They shall seek him. Your heart shall live forever. At the end of the world shall remember and turn unto the Lord. And all the kindreds of the nations shall worship before thee. For the kingdoms is the Lord's, and he is the governor among the nations. And they that be fat upon the earth shall eat and worship. All they that go down to the dust shall bow before him, and none can keep alive his own soul. <clears throat> a seed shall serve him, it shall be accounted to the Lord for a generation. They shall come and shall declare his righteousness unto a people that shall be born that he hath done this. Great psalm, and you can, I'm sure that uh, you can pick out the verses that kind of speak to the Lord there. Just a couple of more on this subject. Matthew 26, 28. For this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. That was Jesus speaking. 1 Peter 2.24 Who his own self bear our sins upon his body on the tree, that we, bring, that we, being dead to sins, should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes ye were healed. That's a copy of what I already read from uh, Psalms. 1 Peter 3.18 For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. Great passages. So I hope these passages spoke to you as they did me. A few thoughts on this offering. Uh, we saw there in verse 2. Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, If a soul shall sin through ignorance against any of the commandments of the Lord, concerning these things, which ought not to be, and shall do against any of them. So ignorance or just a uh, sinful nature, Acts 3, 17 through 19. And now, brethren, I want that I, uh, through ignorance, you did it, as did also your rules. 
But these things which God before had showed by the mouth of all his prophets that Christ should suffer, he hath so, so, so fulfilled. Repent ye therefore and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. And jump into verse 12. <clears throat> Without the camp, I forgot to put it in here. There it is. Four, twelve. Even the whole bullock shall he carry forth without the camp unto a clean place where the ashes are poured out and burn him on a, the wood wood fire where the ashes are poured out shall he be burnt. So this is speaking to outside the camp like we were talking about. Someplace outside this area. Well, when it comes to Jesus Christ, remember that he was actually crucified on a hill outside the walls of Jerusalem. That's the, So it's a foretelling of exactly what uh, where Jesus is going to be uh uh, crucified. So a few verses on that, Exodus 29, 14. But the flesh of the bullock and his skin, his dung, shalt thou bring with fire without the camp. It is a sin offering. So this is always done, done outside the camp to symbolize Jesus uh, as our sin offering. Leviticus 16, 27. And the bullock for a sin offering and the goat for a sin offering, whose blood was brought in to make atonement in the holy place, shall one carry forth without the camp, and they shall burn it in the fire, their skins and their flesh and their dung, the whole animal. Numbers 19.3. And ye shall give her unto Eleazar the priest, that he may bring her forth without the camp, and one shall slay her before his foes. And Hebrews 13.10-13. 13, we have an altar where whereof they have no right to eat, which serve the tabernacle. For the bodies of these beasts, whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin, are burned without the camp. Wherefore, Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered without the gate. Let's go forth, therefore, unto him without the camp, bearing his reproach. And the last passage is the interpretive one. The camp was also Judaism. So outside of Judaism, a religion of, of forms and ceremonies, Jesus also, that he might sanctify, separate, or set apart for God, the people with through his own blood suffered without the gate, the temple gate, city gate. So i.e. Ju uh, Judaism, civil and religious. So if you notice there in Hebrews 13, 12, I'll read it again. Wherefore, Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood suffered without the gate. But how does this sanctify or set apart our people? Let us go forth, therefore, unto him without the camp. Judaism then, uh, Judaized Christianity now. Uh, anything religious which denies him as our sin offering, bearing his reproach. So back to verse 13. Let us go forth, therefore, unto him without the camp, bearing his reproach. So the sin offering burned without the camp typifies the aspect of the death of Christ. The cross becomes a new altar and a new place where, without the smallest merit in, its, in themselves, the redeemed gather to offer, as believer priests, spiritual sacrifices. So jumping down to Hebrews 13, 15. By him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually, that is, the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. So we should spread it to others. And share, the, and share the gospel. 1 Peter 2, 5. Ye also as lively stones are built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices, acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. And 1 Peter 2, 24. The bodies of the sin offering beasts were not burned without the camp, as some have fancied, because saturated with sin and unfit for a holy camp. Rather, an unholy camp was unfit place for a holy offering. Yeah, some people like to look at it from the standpoint that Jesus was put outside the camp, like there was something wrong with Jesus. It was just the opposite. Jesus was sacrificed outside the camp because the camp was not holy, and Jesus was holy. So the dead body of our Lord was not saturated with sin, though it, through, it, through it our sins have been born. 
1 Peter 2.24. Who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we be in dead to sins should live under righteousness, by whose stripes ye are healed. So that's our lesson for today, and that was the offering for the priest. But I love the analogy of the fact that uh, that the priest, uh, uh, by example, uh, took care of making sure he atoned for his sins first, so he could properly atone for the sins of the people. And that's the, that's basically saying that uh, as the high priest and symbolically of anyone who is uh, teaching others, really needs to be careful that they do it in a way that's uh, uh, honoring to God. Uh, not and trying to be as accurate as possible about what you believe about the word. I can think of lots of examples, but uh, I think that's why it's, in, it's important to be careful about uh, when we teach and uh, and when we when, when we speculate to make sure we fully make people understand when we're speculating and when we're actually speaking from the word uh, and not trying to. Uh, get praise or honor or something or, or, or try to try to make things up to make it sound more interesting or even sometimes make things up because you're feeling guilty about something. Trust me, God can see everything I, we do. So you're not hiding anything from anybody. And I like to try to think of it that way, that uh, Jesus is right here beside me and everything I'm saying, he's hearing clear as bell. And so I better be trying to honor him as best I can uh, because someday I'm going to have to answer for it. So, that's our message for today, and a little bit shorter than usual, but that's okay. Great Friday and great message about uh, being a good example. I think that's, uh, and but we're still sinners too, so uh, we are going to fail uh, sometimes. I know I definitely do. So let's pray. Oh Lord, thank you for this lesson, this reminder that uh, we do we do have to be responsible to our actions when it comes to uh, being leaders whether it be in your church or at home as uh, parents, that we are uh, ever mindful that uh, we have young eyes watching us and we got to be careful about what we do so that uh, we can honor you uh, and that they can see you through us and help us to do that every day, Lord. And I will give you all the praise and thanks. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Okay, you guys have a great weekend and I will see you again tomorrow, I mean Monday. And we'll head it and we'll continue with chapter four. Mm -hmm.